regardless of your opinion of how much regulation or how much intervention the government should have in markets and in capitalism generally, I think it's interesting to take a look at the various cycles that have happened in the United States, both from an economic point of view and also from a regulatory point of view. And if we start in the late 1800s, and in the late 1800s, so we've had the Civil War, we've had Reconstruction, you actually have a crisis, uh, a kind of a depression after the Civil War. But then after that depression, at the end of the 1800s, the United States comes roaring back. It becomes a major industrialized nation. And be part of that industrializing process, you have some gentlemen who become very, very, very wealthy. You have Cornelius Vanderbilt. He, his wealth was in the rail and the steamboats. John D. Rockefeller, known as some by some people as the historiest, not the historiest, the wealthiest man in history. And that may or may not be the case, but he was definitely the wealthiest man in American history. And if you inflation adjust, so if some accounts will say he had $1.5 billion, you might say, wait, I know of people who have more than $1.5 billion. But if you inflation adjust the amount of money that John D. Rockefeller had at the turn of the century, it comes out to $400 billion to $600 billion. So this is a lot more than anyone that we know of in present times. You have Andrew Carnegie in the steel business. His net worth, if you look at it in a present value basis, is approximately $300 billion. You have people like JP Morgan. And although his net worth, also a huge, huge amount, but where his power was really in, in since he was kind of a, in control of the financial world at that time, his financial power was tremendous, maybe uh, more than the type of power that these gentlemen could wield. That the, the amount of power that him and his associates controlled through their various holdings, uh, some have said, was uh, amounted to the amount of wealth in all of the United States west of the Mississippi. So these 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 are hugely powerful, hugely wealthy men. The type of power and wealth that we actually have not seen since, and. You can decide what you think of these people. On some on some level, all of these people were, I'm sure they were good entrepreneurs. I'm sure they were hardworking. I'm sure they innovated in their own way. But they are also known for back then. You know, th this is uh, uh, this might be why it would have given fuel to to someone like Marx, who would look at people like this and say, look, these people have so much power. Labor has no power com compared to them. Some of the employees in some of these companies, it's hard to really, you know, say that they are independent human beings. They're almost like slave labor. They live on the campus. They have no rights. People are dying while they're working for some of these organizations. So you can decide where you will, but the reality is is that these people were hugely, hugely, hugely wealthy, hugely powerful. Now you fast forward to the early 1900s, and you start having a little bit of a backlash against these, uh, I guess, the, 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 the system in which these type of people can thrive. And you have Teddy Roosevelt comes to power in 1901. And one of the things, he's famous for many things, but one of the things he's famous for is being a trust buster. And when he talks about trust, a trust is really just a large corporation. And the idea is, is that, look, Standard Oil, you have essentially taken control of the refining in the oil industry in America. You have become a monopolist. You need to be broken up. This is anti-competitive. Remember, capitalism, for the capitalist's sake, for capitalism's sake, is maybe not that good of an idea. What we want is competition. What we want is innovation. What we want is incentives. And if you control everything and no one can compete, that's not helping anyone. So Teddy Roosevelt, he, it, it didn't happen during his administration, but he kind of started the trust busting process. And in the next administration, in Taft's administration, you actually have Standard Oil being broken up. And just to get an idea of how big Standard Oil was, if you take Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, Conoco, and pretty much every other major US oil company, put them together. I'm not saying that's the equivalent of Standard Oil. That's actually what Standard Oil was. That when Standard Oil was broken up during the Taft's administration, it was actually broken up into all of these corporations. And you can look into it more. So you can imagine how much power someone like that would hold. So the pendulum swung in one extreme at the end of the 1800s. Roosevelt comes in, once again, Republican president, very strong president. But he said, look, enough is enough. This is too much. This is not in the best interest of the American people. We need competition. And you fast forward even more. In the 20s, you have this huge boom. Uh, things are looking well. Whenever there's a boom, people look the other way. People think, oh, we don't need much regulation. We don't need much uh, government intervention. But then booms, many times, almost always, lead to busts. And then you have the Great Crash of 29, leads into the Great Depression. People are unhappy with 
Herbert Hoover, FDR come comes into power in the in kind of the heart of the Great Depression. He stays president until World War II. And in his attempts to take the, the, the country out of the Great Depression, he has his New Deal set of programs. And some of the New Deal programs were essentially to make use of all of the labor and industrial capacity that was going unused during the Great Depression. So it was kind of this Keynesian philosophy that the if no one else is going to supply the demand to use all of these factories and to use all these people, the government will. And so there were these huge public works projects. But there was also regulation getting involved here to kind of stop some of the things that were perceived caused the boom and the bust. And so you have the Glass-Steagall Act, which is most famous for separating investment banking from uh, depository institutions, essentially saying the same people who are taking your deposits can't on the other side take your deposits and gamble with them in the stock market. Uh, this is when Social Security passed. So this, once again, providing a safety net, going in slightly in the socialist direction, um, saying, hey, look, we can't have, if we're a civilized rich country, we can't have people going hungry in the streets. We can't have uh, older people who've you know, done their work, who've contributed to society, now all of a sudden that we're in the middle of depression. We can't have them starving to death or not having them have at least a basic level of existence. So you have Social Security, safety nets coming into play. You have Fannie Mae being created, which you know the part of the Fannie Mae narrative uh, plays all the way into uh, into 2008 and and continues to be a part of of the story with the American uh, housing situation. But what this is is an organization that essentially can buy mortgages. And when it's buying mortgages, it's essentially lending money to people for mortgages. And the reason why the government did this is the government, this is a separate organization that implicitly had the backing of the government, which says that Fannie Mae can borrow from people. But if for whatever reason, one day Fannie Mae can't pay back its loans, the government will back it up. It will make good on those loans. So what that allowed Fannie Mae to do is to borrow money at very low interest rates, essentially close to the rate that the US government could borrow at, and then loan that money at very low interest rates to people who want to buy houses. So it essentially subsidized home ownership. Subsidized, I should say not home ownership, subsidized home borrowing. And I want to make that clear, because if everyone now has more borrowing power to buy a home, then most likely that will just increase the price of houses. So it's really not subsidizing home borrowing. But that's a whole other topic. But once again, the, the government is getting involved. Here, they're trying to do a little bit of engineering. And once again, this goes against letting the market do its thing. This is a distortion in the market. This is a distortion in the market. It's a distortion because, once again, it's anti-competitive. If someone else wanted to do what Fannie Mae did but didn't have the backing of the government, it wouldn't be able to compete because it wouldn't be able to borrow money as cheaply. And you keep fast forwarding. You get to Lyndon Johnson's administration. Obviously, there were other people in between. You get to Lyndon Johnson's administration, you have the Great Society. And the Great Society, great society amongst other things, food stamps, war on poverty, Medicare, Medicaid. So once again, saying, hey, society needs to have some base level of support for people. And I'm not going to take sides one way or the other, but it's it, the pendulum was definitely swinging in, in the direction of more more social safety nets and more attempts to uh, make kind of a, a level playing field. And, and you can debate whether they were successful or not. And the other thing, and this is completely unrelated to what this conversation is about, but whenever someone learns about Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt in the same video, it begs the question, how were they related in some way? And it does turn out they were fifth cousins. But even more interesting, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was Franklin Roosevelt's wife, was Teddy Roosevelt's niece. So there, there actually was a pretty close relationship between all of these Roosevelts. And on another interesting thing, I just found this on the internet. Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt was also the first president to ride in the open in an automobile. And it's funny to see the his Secret Service agents over here riding, riding bicycles to keep up. Anyway, complete tangent. So you had, just to review where we are, end of 1800s, you have what some people have called, you know, when, if they want to be insulting of these people, the robber barons, the people, you know, they've, they've, they've concentrated a huge amount of wealth. Then the pendulum starts swinging back with Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and then Lyndon Johnson. And then you fast forward, even through the 70s, 
you still have kind of a fairly heavy regulation of many industries in the US. Jimmy Carter, who's considered quite liberal, you have to do, give him, if you are anti-regulation, give him some credit. He, he actually deregulated the airline industry. And frankly, that's why it's hard. For, that, that, that's why airline tickets are actually fairly inexpensive if you, uh, if you look at them on an inflation-adjusted basis. But then the pendulum swings back again into less government, less regulation under Ronald Reagan. So this is Ronald Reagan here, and he's kind of most known, amongst other things. I mean, you know, he. Some people think that he brought communism to the brink, uh, but he also was big on less, on less government. So fr from the, the story of the 1900s until then was kind of more and more regulation, more safety nets, more government, and then Ronald Reagan is comes in less government, lower taxes. Although he spent a ton on the military, and the military is government. And what's interesting is in this period, during the 80s, you start having an economic boom. You could debate whether it was due to Ronald Reagan or was maybe to do things due to things that were completely out of his control. Maybe it was due to automation and information technology it starts to becoming big, and he has nothing to do with that. But regardless, to say, you do start having an economic boom in the 80s, and then the 90s it starts to accelerate under Bill Clinton. And the interesting thing you see is when things are good, the temptation for government to regulate goes down. And under Bill Clinton, who's a Democratic, considered liberal, you have welfare reform. Welfare reform, which does undo a lot of, uh, or I guess it makes it takes a more conservative take on welfare. It makes it harder to have welfare for longer periods of time, and you also have the repeal of Glass-Steagall. So the repeal, the repeal of Glass-Steagall. So even though Bill Clinton was was uh, considered liberal. I mean, maybe he would blame these things on having a Republican Congress who forced him into it or, or, or whatever else. The reality is it did happen under his administration, that kind of a government stepping out of welfare a little bit and, de and allowing to, or a kind of a deregulation of banks, allowing for investment banking and commercial banking to start getting commingled again. And then you keep forwarding through the Bush administration. Once George W. Bush, I could put uh, uh, his dad in here in between, but actually he was forced to raise taxes. So I, I, you can't really include him in the conversation of, of less government. And he would claim that he was forced to do that because of Democrats. But it, all the way through all of these presidencies, while things were kind of on this upward march, you had this constant stream of deregulation. And all the way until you get to all the way until you get to 2008, and you have a major, major financial crisis. And who knows now, sitting in 2011, where that pendulum will swing back. But there is a sense that maybe this, all of this went too far. And probably the worst signs of this is this whole idea that emerged during the 2008 crisis of too big to fail. Too big to fail, which is kind of kind of the worst of capitalism and socialism it's kind of like corporate welfare it's like it's like not only are you not are you not giving benefit to those who want to innovate or do well you have these huge entities that that control so much wealth that control so much of the economy and and they and they get there by taking huge amounts of risk and as soon as they do incompetent stupid things that put all of us at risk the government comes in to bail them out because it's essentially they're holding the economy hostage. If the economy, if the government does not bail these characters out, they might take the entire economy with them. My sense is that they tried to scare the government a little bit more to have the government believe that, so they do get bailed. But regardless, to say it does lead kind of a a, a moment in time where 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 society, or at least American society, really the world, has to question. Uh, how much regulation is appropriate? How much, so, you know, how much control over the financial system do should private institutions be allowed to have? And you know, Fannie Mae is an interesting one because once again, it's a government, it's a government-sponsored institution that was pseudo-private. It was kind of the worst of both worlds. And once again, it's still being propped up by the government, and it's a major distortion. It's a major distortion in markets, but to some degree, the government is afraid of letting it completely fall through now because it would probably tank the economy to some degree. So anyway, hopefully you found that interesting. I just wanted to give you some perspective on on the swinging of the pendulum between government regulation and more uh, kind of you know capitalism without regulation that we've we've seen in the United States over you know roughly the last hundred or so years.